This is Joan, and I hope that you're having a wonderful day and that the Sabbath was a great day for you. Well, what you're looking at here is a picture of two guys wrestling. And what I wanted to put this here for was for it to be a euphemism for the wrestling going on between the narcissist and the empath. Now, to me, astrology does give you a lot of information. Now, I also believe that even the devil cannot tell you everything that's in your chart. He knows a whole lot more than you do, but it's the Most High who knows your end from your beginning. The devil doesn't. He can guess, and he can try to... Whatever it is he's doing, it is probably in your chart. I don't even think probably. I think everything you do is in there. All the choices you have, the choices you ultimately make, though, are probably known beforehand. Well, I think I definitely know beforehand by the most time. The point I'm making is that probably at the time of your conception, because your conception is even in your chart, if you're familiar with astrology, your conception is your ninth house cusp. Your conception is there. The ascendant is telling you what was going on around you at the time of your birth. Now, I know for me, I'm an Aries rising, so what that basically means is that for some reason, my mother was being rushed. She was being told to hurry up, do this faster, 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 faster. Now, how you can give birth faster, I don't understand, but, you know, this is a, a world where lots of bizarre things are going on. The point is, you're probably marked at birth, you know, I think that the Heavenly Father, like he said, hey, I, I knew you before I knew you before you were born. I knew you when you when you were in your mother's womb. So from that moment that you come to this earth through the matrix or enter into the matrix, the Heavenly Father knows you. The person who really doesn't know you is you. You don't know exactly what you would do under certain circumstances and you don't know who you are. Now, I know that this is the case with empaths. Empaths are here blind. I think that there's some sort of a weird possibility that these other people, these Genesis 1 people, have some idea of who they are and that they, or maybe it's instinctual, they are searching for you. They are searching for empaths to wrestle with. Now, the thing is, initially, they may not know that that's what they're doing. They may honestly, like they say in the honeymoon phase, they may honestly totally idealize you. But somewhere along the line, while you are still loving on them, they began to plot on you. While they're still smiling at you, while they're still making love to you, while they're still doing whatever it is they did that made you think that this was a person worthy of being with. They're still going to be doing that, but they're wrestling with you. The problem is you are on their side. You don't know you're wrestling, and especially I think with women, you're taught to be supportive. So if you aren't careful, you'll be supportive of them wrestling you. Now, to illustrate the point I'm making, or the points I'm making, I saw two films that I thought were both really, really good. Uh, the first one was a documentary, Tina Turner's documentary. Now, you may feel like you know everything about her from the movie, What's Love Got to Do With It, and her book. And this is kind of a more detailed account. You know, but uh, the film, from what I saw, was pretty accurate. So the documentary just gives you details. And I'm, you can con contrast that with the Betty Broderick story. I think it's called Dirty John on Netflix. Now this is the story of Betty Broderick. This is a white, upper-class woman at, from, um, well, a white, upper-class woman. And you compare that with where Tina Turner started from. Now, the thing that you might look at this and say, well, they probably don't have a lot in common, 
Actually, they do. And just like the Heavenly Father, the devil always the devil always copies the Most High. And if you think about it, he has no choice. The Most High, everything comes from him. Even if you say, I made a new thing, well, where'd you get the materials? You didn't make them. Heavenly Father did. So the devil is not copying because he wants to. He just simply has no choice, which to me should tell you right there, well, stand down. You, you, you are a created being. How are you going to go against the Creator? And even if, like some people say, he's not going against the Creator, he's going against the Savior. Well, this is the Most High Son. You know, it's like people talk about sibling rivalry, but sometimes you do have to recognize that a sibling may have it going on more than you do. That's It's just how it is. The, the Bible does not say everyone was created equal. As I said in the last video, I think that there are three types of people here. You have your empaths sent by the Most High. You have your narcissists sent by the Most Low. You have your regulars. Everybody is being tested. Just because you might have, now this is my theory, just because you might have a certain proclivity toward a certain thing does not mean you have to do that thing. It just means you probably will. For instance, if you go back and look at Cain, the Most High was speaking to Cain. There is nobody who can who can convince you more than the absolute most high. But if you believe the serpent seed doctrine, which I do, well, then you believe that his father was the devil. So he had a certain proclivity toward evil, but that does not mean he had to do it. It just means that he probably will do it. So you got these three people on earth. At least the regulars and the empaths don't know what they're doing here. The empath may know that they have a, a certain... Well, let me say that the empath, especially looking at both the stories of Betty Broderick and Tina Turner, empaths tend to have one thing in common, and that's that they come from a family that did not nurture them that did not tell them that they were important or special or that they should be taken care of. These are things that they go through life looking for. And maybe that is part of the way that the narcissist figures them out almost instinctively. They're looking, narcissists are looking for people who are like gold but who don't know it who are walking through life with this radiance but don't know that they have it. For a fact, they may be surrounded by people who are telling them that they suck, period. <clears throat> Excuse me. Like, I remember Tina Turner when she came, well, not when she came out, but when she came back in the 80s. And she was saying that people were, especially white people, were talking about her beautiful legs and stuff. And she was saying that when she was growing up, you know, running, playing around in the cornfields or wherever she came from. Nobody thought anything of her legs. Nobody said anything about her legs. She did not think that she had anything special. Well, that is the story of most empaths. They have something, they have a talent, they have a glow, they have something that people notice. And if they're narcissistic and they come from a narcissistic, well, I'm sorry, empaths have something that their family may notice. Chances are, from what I've seen, most empaths come from families with narcissists. It's like they have, they're born for the fight. They just don't know it. So they grow up feeling like, well, my family doesn't even like me. I'm, it must be something wrong with me. What that causes them to do is work harder. That causes them to glow more. That will attract more narcissists. Now that's probably not something you have heard before or even a lot. Most people tell you, I'm going to tell you how to not attract narcissists. As I said in the earlier video, if you are an empath, you can't help but attract narcissists. They are attracted to your glow. The only way to not attract them is to get rid of your glow, which is to 
change yourself. It's to renege on the gift that you were given. From what I've seen, well, you know Tina Turner's story. She worked for years in for or with her husband, Ike. Now, from what I've seen, Ike did seem to be narcissistic or to, as I put it, have enough traits so that being around him would be problematic for the nurse, for the empath, rather. But Ike, Ike, like most empaths, recognizes something, a talent, a gift, a certain glow in the empath. The empath doesn't notice. So, on one hand, the narcissist, the narcissist is torn. They want to exploit that talent, but every time that talent is used, they get jealous. So on one hand, they are trying to encourage the person to get out there and do something. But on the other hand, they are so terribly jealous that they need this person to do this, that they don't have that glow. They know they don't have it. And it makes them angry, but at the same time, they're using this empath, so they need the empath to go. Now, another, well, the thing about Betty Broderick was, if you look at the movie, the series about her, she was, in the original film, they portrayed her as being, I don't know, I don't know, as being a witch as being a witch with a B. Because I don't really like to curse, and I don't think that they really let you do it much anymore anyway, which I think is kind of good. But that's off the subject. They, She was played by Meredith Baxter Burney, and they portrayed her in an extremely harsh light. They said that she was bullying, she was crazy, she was going around doing insane things to her ex-husband, and he was a sad victim who who put up with her as much as he could, but then he needed an escape. Now that's what, that's how she was portrayed. I think this film came out in the 90s. The series now goes much more into, into detail and shows you that this was a woman who came from a family that offered her no support. I mean, beyond the absolute minimum, and this was her mother and her father. So, again, she's going out into the world feeling like she's flawed. And because she feels flawed, she works harder. She has also been taught, the same with Tina Turner, that she's nothing on her own. She needs to seek that love. We are all being told that. I remember it's an old song, uh, you're nobody till somebody loves you, so get some, get yourself somebody to love. Okay. That song, and the many other songs, encourages you to go out there and give your all to somebody. It uh, was even a saying when I was coming up that if you want to be a friend, if you want to have a friend, be a friend. Not necessarily. You can be the best friend in the world to some people and they are still going to laugh at you eventually and stab you in the back. Just because they feel like they can. Just because how dare you be a good friend when I'm not one. So therefore, I must destroy you. And again, we go back to Cain. Cain, when he saw that his gift, his offering to the Most High was not as good as his brother, did not go and say, well, shoot, let me straighten this out. Let me fix it. He decided, let me kill my brother. Well, that story is there as a warning and as an illustration of what you're dealing with every day. The family you're you're coming from, if you are a empath, chances are somebody was in that family, somebody in a in authoritative role, authoritarian role. Somebody back there convinced you you need the only way you really count is to help them out, to do stuff for them, to shine the light on them, not on yourself. So another part of my theory is that we are all, we're all here, and this is a test. This is one long, arduous test. I think going back to the Garden of Eden, it's a test. God, the Heavenly Father, knows 
He's got some people down here who are walking blind, so he's given them a book. But at the same time, this is a long test. Just like if you have a long journey, you've got to be in shape. So he does not make it easy for you to figure this out. The shape he primarily wants you to be in is mental, spiritual. You've got to, you've got to think. You've got to get those gray cells working. You've got to look around this world and question stuff. There are many things to stop you from doing this. Number one is your church, if you're African American, most definitely. Well, at least it was in my generation. I don't think it's as much now. But number two is the educational system. It also is telling you that you don't need to think. Just parrot back what I'm telling you. Even though most of what I'm telling you isn't true, that's why I don't want you to think. Because I don't want you to look this up for yourself. I don't even want you to open your window up and look out and see. Look at how people are acting. Look at what they're doing. They don't want you to do that. If you do that, you'll get called names like nerd, bookworm, crazy, whatever. And that is one of the things, major things, a narcissist is going to call you crazy. What did the people call the Savior? Crazy. Everything that's in the Bible is there for you to look at and exercise. You need to exercise because you are wrestling for your life. Now, the other thing I wanted to show you or illustrate, well, um, compare and contrast about the Betty Broderick and the Tina Turner stories is that Tina Turner walked away with nothing. She said, Psh, keep it. Take everything but my name. That's my name. That's how people recognize me. I'll keep my name. Whatever else you have, whatever else we made, even though I was the one out front dancing in, in the shortest skirts possible, that was me. That was not you. Even so, even though people are coming to see me, they don't even know that you have a particular talent because you stand in the back. I remember uh, Ike and Tina Turner. It seemed like she was a wild woman. I remember that. I remember when they started saying that she had been abused. I was like, you're, you're kidding. She seems like she could, you know, handle herself. No, that's just how it seems. The narcissist makes a dream world and if you stick around he'll make you be a part of it but ultimately he sees a talent that he can exploit but at the same time he's exploiting that talent he's also very jealous of you for having it and the Bible tells you jealousy is crueler than the grave don't get it twisted if you don't hear anything else I'm telling you hear me para quoting paraphrasing rather the Bible the narcissist wants you dead period they want you dead the longer you stay with them the more you're shortening your life or heightening the possibility of you not being here tomorrow and that is your test now Betty Broderick on the other hand she sent her husband now the first thing which I thought was really telling in that series was the first thing he said, one of the first things he said to her when he met her was, wow, you're perfect. Now you're going to think that that is a compliment if a guy tells you that or if a girl tells you that, but I'm speaking more to women because it's a fallacy that the court system favors women. Nah, no it doesn't. Mm -mm. I had to go through a divorce. I had a female judge. And no, they don't favor women, especially black women. But that's an aside. But the first thing he said was, you're perfect. Okay, that sounds like a compliment. But basically what he's saying is, you're perfect for what I have in mind. I need someone who is smart, but doesn't really know it. Who is a hard worker, but doesn't really know it who has accomplished things that they're not giving their cre themselves credit for. If they are an orphan or if there's nobody there to stop me, that's even easier. That's like picking the low-hanging fruit. Only the low-hanging fruit is gold. This is perfect. So, now according to the series, 
And I, I hope that you do watch it just for a study in narcissism. Even if you don't believe that he hits that her now deceased ex-husband was a narcissist, it is a study in how people with enough narcissistic traits to make them hard to deal with operate and how you can get yourself into trouble with them. So, as I was saying, first thing he said was, you're perfect. And that sounds like, especially if you come from a family that never acknowledges anything you do. If you come from a family that says, you walk in and say, look, mom, I got straight A's. And they say, well, it's about time. Okay, if you say, look, mom, I came in second place at the science fair. And they'll say, well, who came in first? If you run in and say, well, not necessarily only moms, but in a way, moms are your nurturers. So, and also your first teachers. So, don't underestimate the importance of mom. If you walk in and say, mom, I made cheerleader. Oh, so you're going to go out there and shake your butt in front of everybody. No matter what you accomplish, they are not going to let you enjoy it. So if you had 18, 20, 25 years of this, you don't think much of your accomplishments. You don't think you're anything special. For a fact, you think unless you are helping someone else, someone who you think is, is more of whatever it is you're told that you're not, unless you're doing that, you don't think that you count much one way or the other. So when this person walks up, who has probably, who has most definitely presented themselves in the most pleasing light to you, when they say something like, you're perfect, well, pretty much it's a go. You have been, you're like a starving person who someone sprinkled some water on. You will follow them anywhere. You will think this is the kindest person in the world because you have been treated unkindly. They see this. They know what you are. They know you have a lot to offer. They know something even more important. You don't know it. They know something else. You don't have anybody there really helping you. Now, if they want you and you do have someone who might be saying, you know what, your friend ain't quite right. Yo, no, he shouldn't or she shouldn't. Uh-uh, that's not right. If you have somebody who's saying that to you, they will get rid of them. They will get rid of them by telling you, basically, it's either me or them. And you know, I love you. I'm the one who came in and told you how wonderful you were. How in the world are you going to get away from me? Now, I don't really make any difference between the narcissist, the sociopath, the psychopath, the because basically, a narcissist is a chameleon. They are whatever it takes to get whatever they want. And their ultimate goal is to kill you. Now, they may not kill you physically. Betty Broderick's husband didn't kill her, but he did totally isolate her. And there is a difference between men and women. In a divorce, the friends generally go to the husband. They just do. If you have children with the narcissist, there's a 50-50 chance, at least, your children will take after him. Therefore, they're going to look at you as weak. All narcissists are going to look at you as weak. They're going to say, well, wait a minute. You let him do this? Okay, understand this impact. You didn't let him do anything. He simply did it. Okay, so the friends you have when you are married and married to a narcissist, even if you aren't married to a narcissist, generally the friends go to the husband if they were like couples. So, you divorce a narcissist that you had children with, your friends are gone, pretty much. And like the story showed right there, if you are fighting the narcissist, you're going against your grain. You are doing, and plus you're coming in late. The narcissist has laid all kinds of traps for you. He's been plotting and planning this for a long time. You're just walking in new and everything is shocking to you. It's not shocking to him, to you. Well, it's not shocking to him because he's prepared it. So you're walking in fighting and it's kind of a lost battle. He's already won it. And I do 
believe that even if you look back in the Garden of Eden, this is a man's world. It's a man's world. Like, I do believe what uh, James Brown said, but it's nothing without a woman and a girl. But still, that woman and a girl got to understand, this is a man's world. Now, why anybody would want to claim the world in the condition it is, you know, so don't think that I'm trying to say women are weak or stupider. I'm simply saying that this world favors men, period. You can fight against it, you can argue against it, but it is kind of like a pink elephant sitting on your couch. You can ignore it, but it's breaking your couch down. It's also taking up a lot of your space. Wouldn't it be better to find some way to, you better find some way to work around that pink elephant, find a way not to, to get it out of your, your, off of your couch at least so it doesn't break it? You get my point. Certain facts, you just have to accept that at this particular moment, you can't really change it. People have been trying for the longest, but the Bible told you that, hey, he will dominate you. Dominate does not mean he's going, it means he's going to rule over you unjustly, period. In the courts, when you go apply for jobs, when you try to get movie roles, no matter what, he is going to abuse the authority he has, period. Face it, live with it, and until the Savior fixes it. And I know a lot of you don't want to hear this, but... Like I said, I believe in facing the truth. I don't believe in arguing with gravity. If I throw something up in the air, I know that no matter how much I argue, unless I have found a force that overpowers that gravity, whatever I throw up is going to fall down. That's why I tend to talk or frame this more as if I'm speaking to women because I know that as a woman, you, you've got a harder route to go. Because the person who is dominating you is somebody that you love. So, now that we've gotten that out of the place, like I was saying about Betty Broderick and divorcing a narcissist, if you have children, now in my time, for my generation, boys tended to want to protect their moms. Now, things have gotten so twisted now, I can't say that that's a definite. But if you are an empath divorcing a narcissist and you've had children by him, there's a good chance your girls, especially, are going to turn against you. They just are. They're going to feel like, well, if they're narcissistic, they're going to feel, number one, you're weak. You should have been able to fight him off. You should have been able to do this. Plus, I do believe the sexes have a natural attraction for each other. So the girls are, until they get older, there's a chance they're going to back him up against you. If you have sons, like I was saying, in earlier generations, the boys may have been more inclined toward being nice to their mom, saying that, hey, my mom suffered and then growing up and doing the same thing to someone else's daughter. It's illogical, but that tended to be how it happened. But the thing is, I just want to warn you that even though you were the one who carried this child for nine months, you were the one who, in great pain, pushed him out in the world, you were the one who more than likely made sure that they had cl food, clothing, and shelter, and if there was a choice between you having and then them having. It was you who said, I'll just do without so that they can have more. Regardless of all that, especially if they are narcissistic themselves, they're going to, at least initially, they're probably going to favor their father, period. So you might wind up with not just, well, your friends are probably going to question you or turn against you. People in this time, or people maybe in all time, favor the victor. And in this case, at least initially, he's going to look like, and like I said, I do recognize female narcissists, but I also recognize that women don't have the power that men have socially. But I also do believe that narcissists are possessed. They have a they're getting their messages straight from the devil. That's why they can seem so much larger than life. 
Now they also, some of them, will do whatever it takes to know what you're doing so that they can lay these um, landmines for you. They will bug your phone, bug your car, they will, whatever technology they, they can get their hands on, just to be one step beyond you is what they will do. But the scenario I'm pointing or painting for you is that if you're an empath divorcing a narcissist, you can fight like Betty Broderick did. She fought with everything she had. And it was hard for her to fight because she didn't really have that much of a support. She had friends, at least initially, but friends will, you know, people favor the victor for the most part. Her children, they're children. They don't they don't know everything and plus like I said if you have children with a narcissist you got a 50-50 chance you you're raising a narcissist so you're sitting there and also you may be so stressed out that steady employment is difficult or you might go to the job and do something like burst into tears now one thing I've noticed in life is that White women are allowed to go to jobs and burst into tears or go to school classrooms and burst into tears. If black people are around, Hispanics and every other race is allowed to do that. If you're a mixed race, if you're a mixed race female, especially if you're attractive, you're allowed to do that. But a black woman, you're not allowed to do that. For the most part, no. You have been given the stereotype that you're strong. So you are not allowed to go to the school and interrupt the rest of the class because something triggered you and you burst into tears. Nobody's going to come, for the most part, pat you on the back. Maybe if you got a couple of friends in there, but generally, nah. And don't even think about it on your job. Nope. You better find some way to straighten yourself up because the world is not going to hand you a handkerchief. The narcissist and the narcissistic supporters out there will laugh at you and kick you while you're down. I mean, and I'm trying to talk to you the way a an auntie or someone who has been on a trip and made it back tries to warn you because they don't want you to go to the places they've gone. So anyway, with Betty Broderick, and like I said, any empath who is divorcing a a a uh, narcissist, you should definitely look at that film, that series. And uh, it's taking place in the 90s, the 80s and 90s. So you might say, oh, the court system has changed. Yeah, right. Still, it never hurts to be prepared, and it never hurts to not be overly confident now you can do like she did and fight and get and uh, allow your logic to alert your emotions that this is a maddening situation that if people would actually sit and listen they could understand that this is not right you could do that and you could wind up like her or you could do what Tina Turner did you could say, you know what, baby, take it off. If it means I got to run out here naked and barefoot, it is preferable to having to put up another day with you. That, I think, now, of course, I'm not telling you to run out naked. I'm saying that you might have to run out without all the assets you put into this, to this marriage, to this union. But you have to give yourself credit for you were the one holding it up. It was you. It was not the narcissist. They don't have your talent. They don't. That's why one of the reasons that they hate you. They want to use you. They recognize you. They're great talent scouts. But they hate you. They want to kill you. They may not kill you physically, but your spirit dying is just as good to them. They, they, the Bible tells you, you were made from dust. This serpent here will eat dust. He will crawl on his belly. You won't see him unless you're looking now. You won't know that snake. 
when they come out you're shocked you're surprised you don't understand this is a snake I thought it was a lamb okay you got duped but also look at this you have a light on you you're the one with the talent in her case she managed to raise four children while putting this man through medical school then law school now if you're an empath and somebody did that for you you'd be trying to build a golden shrine to them you would because you have the ability to appreciate the narcissist will not feel gratitude he will feel like well she's the best if I outsmart her I outsmarted the best that means I'm the best it's a new king in town and it's me she had a light I defeated the light that's what I did I ate her I devoured her that's what they want so there are now courses out there to tell you how to deal with a narcissist in court my thought for you if you're an empath is look at yourself look at what you did Ignore what your mama, your daddy, your nigga in the alley, whatever it is who was an authority in your childhood who told you you weren't shit. Excuse me. Shitaka. Whoever told you that, ignore them. Tell them they were wrong. And something else that Tina Turner did. Now, if you are an empath, chances are you were born an empath and you have had to fight you didn't know you were fighting you had to fight for your existence for your survival because one of the things the narcissist knows about you that you may not know is that you have the ability to serve remember what the Savior said let the greatest one among you be your servant you on some level are a servant the problem is the narcissist comes and he convinces you to serve him. What you have to do, whatever it is you're going through, what you have to do is take the attention away from that narcissist and to a certain extent you have to take it off yourself. You're born to serve. If you take the, if you don't understand that that is what you do instinctively you will simply find someone else to serve so when I say take that emphasis off yourself again you can look to the you can compare and contrast Tina Turner with Betty Broderick one of the key things people saw in the movie or read in the book or we'll see in the documentary that Tina Turner did was she became a Buddhist now I don't believe in that but what I do see that it did was it forced her to take her emphasis off of Ike but also to take it off of herself to look to something outside herself that was greater than her and Ike and to serve it that is not what Betty Broderick did and because she didn't do that she lost some friends or it might have helped her to lose some of her friends in that she could not stop talking about what was being done to her and I think that that is a normal kind of reaction it will not be easy but if you were born in an empath you were not put here for it to be easy this is your test this is your supreme test to do two things take that emphasis off of that narcissist so that you aren't worshiping him because ultimately even though they plan on killing you or at least sucking all the life out of you they still want you to serve them because you're great at it that's what you that's what you do also though you have to take the emphasis off of you now I've seen a lot of videos and they will tell you just the opposite love yourself you gotta you gotta think about you yes you do but just loving you 
You're not strong enough. You're just a, you're a human being. You're an empathic human being, which means you can feel other people. You will simply go find another person to feel. You've got to fill up that ne that need to worship. People have a need to worship. Empaths, empaths want to, well, everybody wants to serve or to worship something. It's just that narcissists worship themselves. They've already figured out what they're going to do, and they're going to do whatever means it takes to do it. You, on the other hand, almost instinctively know that you're put here to do something. Now, I'm not a Buddhist. I don't believe in that. I believe you, we're all, all of us are here to serve the Most High. When you make that your passion, when that is what you're focusing on, you'll recognize that even though this narcissist has, he took my friends, he took my, if I had family, he got them whispering about me, if I had children, the ones sucked at my breast now are talking about me you will know that shit happens happened to the savior it is almost a badge of honor it is even written consider it a consider it joy my brothers when people just dog the shit out of you but recognize also it's temporary and it is because you're walking around shining here and you don't even know it direct that shine toward the most high I mean, it's got to be something. You're going to have to direct that shine to something bigger than you. That is part of what your shine is, your ability to serve outside of yourself. What happens is the narcissist comes in and redirects it. So, I do hope that this video has been helpful to you, my my little, my children. <laughs> I'm an Aquarius and... I finally read something where they said the thing about Aquarius is they treat everybody like they're their mothers. Yeah, maybe. I had never heard that one before, but talking to you, I do feel as though I'm talking to one of my children. You know, and that to me is a great feeling where it's like, you know, I'm reaching out saying, oh, my babies, you know, this is what this world is like. I cannot go and be with you every step of the way but I can warn you about some of the landmines and there's <clears throat> excuse me there's a narciss narcissist up under every bush <laughs> I mean, wherever you go you're gonna find them it doesn't matter if uh, like they say new levels new devils you can get your degrees you can you can marry and, and move to a new neighborhood whatever it is you do especially if you are an empath there's a narcissist out there trying to get you What's it say? The devil acts like a roaring lion seeking who he can devour. So do his children. They are out there. They are trying to get you. They will not stop trying to get you. Doesn't matter that you've gotten older. Only thing that getting older does is it gives you experience. So that narcissists, yeah, they still going to come after you. But you're going to remember, oh shit, this is what the hell I came from. I am not going back there. Nope. Like Solomon said. It is better to sit on the roof of a house than to put up with a nagging woman. Now, that, of course, I know applies to a nagging man also. And also, if you really read about Solomon, well, you know what? If you had just married the way the Heavenly Father told you to, maybe you wouldn't be having that much of a problem. But that is another story entirely. And I am not ignoring my sons, my strong, handsome sons. You are being told that the curses in the Bible are the way you are supposed to live. And you are being taught to be narcissistic. And in the end, it won't work well for you that way. And you are the carriers of the nation. A nation can survive narcissistic women if you don't marry them. If you marry them, you're bringing more narcissists into this world and making stuff hell for everybody. But... That is another story for another day, but recognize that I love my daughters and my sons. I just recognize that sons, if they can avoid joining a gang or marrying a narcissist, as long as they are directing their energy toward the Most High, 
they'll be okay. You'll be all right. Now, when they start really going after the children of the Most High, like cutting off people's heads, well, yeah, your head will probably be cut off too. But generally, socially, you got an edge. Now, I mean, I'm, I'm not hating you for that edge. It, we were told in the Bible you were going to have that edge. I'm just saying, don't abuse the 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 headship you've been given leadership you've been given or whatever you want to call it but anyway sons and daughters you guys have a great day oh and please visit my website I'm going back to forgetting that again the faith based <laughs> faith based counseling center please look me up on Amazon Kindle and eventually I think I'm going to start offering coaching and counseling I am a certified counselor so but you know not right at the moment but it's coming so you guys if you have any questions or concerns please put them in the comments or whatever <laughs> have a great day let me add one more thing because I want to definitely make sure I'm making my point when you compare and contrast the stories of Betty Broderick and Tina Turner to me, one of the major reasons why Tina Turner was successful was that she recognized this, this particular proverb from Solomon, Proverbs 25, 24, better to live on a corner of the roof than share a house with a quarrelsome woman. Sometimes, like, you read something in the Bible and you'll think, well, it's quarrelsome. Does this just mean she wants to argue? It's not a major. Yes, it is. It's not talking just about a quarrelsome woman. This is telling you about narcissism right here and that it is better, like I said, to run away or walk away. It, whenever you leave a narcissist, you're running away. But it is better to run away with nothing than to stand and fight. Okay? I want to make sure I make that point because you'll see some videos and they will tell you, yeah, as soon as you lose, as soon as you leave that narcissist your life is just gonna be great it's gonna be wonderful you're gonna make a million dollars overnight it you might you might not that's that's not the whole point one of the best ways to make money is to be ruthless to be willing to stab your mama in the back if you have to if you are into the occult to sacrifice a few people as an empath as a person who is following the most high hopefully you aren't willing to do that you don't want to do that you want nothing to do with that so when you first leave a narcissist you may not be financially in a great position even if you look again at the Tina Turner story she had to work anywhere she could period whatever kind of job I remember this game show with people Hollywood Square she even had to do that now, there are some who say that she, now I'm not saying it, there are some who will suggest that maybe the way she got back in was she sacrificed Ike. I don't know. She was gone from Ike. The world is, wherever you have narcissists, you've got occultism because they are in contact with the evil spirit world, period. And that's something, again, that you might not be told, but I don't want to give you the impression that it'll just be a wonderful day when you walk away from one of them but still walk away remember you are the one with the God-given talent God does not say well some of the time he does he'll make you rich but he will also make you work for it but again he says he will add no pain with it the devil will definitely make you give you some pain with it he'll give it to you easy but you have to lose a few people stab a few people in the back you have to do some really rotten stuff for his favor it's better for you to walk away know that the light is shining on you that maybe for a while financially you might be struggling but you're struggling with a clear conscience and your light still on you so this time is truly the end, guys, and you 
my sons and daughters, you have a great day.